Communicating your research in only three minutes is very daunting. The three minute thesis competition is now across many different types of universities. Not only are you sort of struggling with having to fit all of that information into three minutes, you are also judged against other people. That is very scary. So last week I was invited by PhD students from the University of Sydney to talk about my top tips and secrets for presenting in a three minute thesis competition. I was also a judge a little bit later on as well. And also the general art of dissemination of your research, but importantly, it was about making sure that we had high impact kind of tools in our tool belt for when we talk about our research. So thank you so much for inviting me. They treated me incredibly well. Alison and Tun, they showed me around the university. I got a tour. I was able to step out sort of like from beyond the YouTube bubble and meet people that are actually subscribers and I loved it. So thank you so much. And now here is my full 45 minute talk. Thanks so much for having me here. It's wicked. This is the first time I've been outside of the YouTube bubble and I've uh, seen real people. I'm talking to real people at last again. I normally just speak this little circle, so it's fantastic. Um, and the things I want to talk to you about today, so I know you've got your three minute thesis coming up. Um, and so what I want to talk to you, the first half of the performance, or performance, first half of my talk, look at me, I'm outside of academia. Um, the first uh, half is going to be my secret formula for short presentations. And why short? Hello, tech man. Hello. How's it going? Good. So um, why short? Well, as early career researchers and as kind of like um, earlier career academics, we don't have much time to talk about our research. Normally in sort of uh, seminars, in uh, conferences, you're normally given like 10 minutes, right? 10, 15 minutes and they flick you through. So what I wanna do is share with you sort of like the high impact stuff that I've learned from running my own business about sort of having pitches. Now in like the startup world, they have these pitches where you sort of like talk, you try to get money from people essentially. And uh, the shortest one I ever had was 30 seconds. I had a 30 second pitch to, I'm not sure if he's his Royal Highness anymore, but the, uh, up to Andrew, Pin Prince Andrew was in the crowd and that was up in Brisbane. So I had to get 30 seconds and share everything I wanted them to know about my business. And in this case, this will translate to what people want to know about your research. Um, and like I said, we want to kind of hit those kind of um, high impact areas for promoting your research. And the second part is about dissemination. So lessons essentially from YouTube. So I spent a lot of time in academia trying to get people interested in my work. And the problem is, is no matter how hard you shout it at people's faces, they're not interested. So I've learned essentially through trial and error and sort of what worked and what hasn't on my YouTube channel about making people kind of uh, listen to you a bit more. And so uh, I want to share those tricks with you as well. And so the first bit is going to be, who's the, here's doing the three minute thesis this afternoon? All right, we've got through. Okay, so hopefully I'm going to share some interesting stuff in the first half that you can include in your three minute thesis. Um, and then the second half is going to be more general about promoting your research. All good. All good. Thank yep. you very much, tech man. All right. So my secret formula. Now, the first thing is always, if you're going for high impact, leave PowerPoint well alone. Push it to the depths of your mind. Because the moment academics and anyone sort of is, is interested in doing a presentation, they immediately sit down, you're like, oh, this is going to be so brilliant. I'm going to sit down, my PowerPoint's going to be awesome. Um, and ultimately, that is the last thing that matters. Now, think back to a presentation that you remember, and it isn't, the, it isn't about the PowerPoint. You're not there going, oh, their transitions were great. Their font choice was just phenomenal, right? That never happens. You actually remember, I think back to ones, I remember one um, presentation where a lady played a ukulele, I don't know what her research was about, but she played the ukulele. I knew it was physics. And also there was another guy who did, um, who did uh, a card trick. And it was about micro machines. And this was like five or six years ago now. So it tells you that I'm not interested in their actual research. I'm more interested in what happened during the presentation. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. So PowerPoint, do not touch it until you go through the steps that I'm going to talk about 
To do even today's presentation, I did the slides after I went through the process I'm going to talk about. And like I said, for your three minute thesis, this is hopefully going to help you. Hello, everyone, again on Zoom. All right. So, the number one rule of going in to a presentation is to remember that people will remember how you made them feel and not what you tell them. So how do you make people feel comfortable, happy, enthusiastic? Like I always sit down before any talk, any presentation, I say, what do I actually want people to feel? Do I want them to be excited at the end? In the middle, do I want them to feel sad about something because I'm talking about the problem I'm solving? So I sort of like look at the emotions that I can actually push out into the world. And luckily, my partner is incredibly patient and she's a drama teacher. And so we sit down and we essentially create a little story, a little dramatic theme that runs through. And it's no different when you're giving a talk because you want people to remember you for all the right reasons, for the good things that you say, for the good research that you're talking about. A lot of the time we think that's information. We think, oh, if we just tell them that, they're going to remember it. It's going to be awesome. No, no, no. They're maybe going to remember that you're a bit boring. They're maybe going to remember that you had too many slides. Then, you know, that's the stuff people remember. So we want to step back and you make people feel comfortable by essentially practicing your talk, all those basic things that we've been told for years that we never do because we think, oh, it's fine, I'll be fine. But practicing your talk, going through all of the kind of, um, all of the things you want to hit, making sure you've got just a simple slide for each one and that you're not overwhelming. And of course, practicing your talk means that you're going to talk more confidently because when you talk confidently and you've got a loud voice and you're kind of putting on a little bit of a character, right? Like this isn't how I normally, inter well, maybe a little bit, but I don't normally sort of like gestate so much and I'm not as loud and all that sort of stuff. But when you're giving a presentation, it's those sort of little signals that say, hey, I'm confident and you can be confident too. Don't worry, I've got this. If it all goes wrong, you're in safe hands. And that's the sort of feelings you want to kind of Build. And like I said, you know, playing a little bit of a caricature of yourself is absolutely fine. Um, and for people that are a little bit more introverted, you can lean into that a little bit. And you know, you can kind of uh, be a little bit quiet, be a bit, a little bit smaller. Don't be not yourself, but just kind of bolster up the kind of comfortable things you feel comfortable with, and it will come through. So feelings, very important. All right, that's what I want to get through. Stay away from the facts early on. So. The next thing that I do, if I'm sort of like doing a three minute thesis presentation uh, or a short thing, is I think about my talk in terms of three words-ish that I want people to take away. Because that's all, honestly, people are going to remember once they remember, oh, there's that really sort of like, you know, this person made me feel really good. I remember them for all the right reasons. And then, of course, Remember when I was thinking back to the good presentations I'd seen, it was like micro machines. That's all I really remembered. Physics, I think it was atomic physics. So it was only two or three words that I actually remember from people's presentations. And maybe you can do the same thing. Think about the really awesome presentations that you've seen, and you won't remember the details. You'll just remember that it's about something and about a person, you know, this person gave it and they did this cool thing. And that's really what we're trying to leverage with these three-ish words. For example, my research was in um, solar paint. So I wanted people to remember that solar paint was efficient. That was it. Those are the things that I want people to remember. And so splitting down what you actually want people to remember down into three, maybe five, no more than five words. It could be that architectural science uh, is really great. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it is, just make sure that it's about three to five words. And that is what we're going to hone in when we give our presentation. Because we're going to make people feel confident. And then we're going to say, these are the three words you need to remember. And actually, we're going to repeat them in three different areas throughout our presentation because repetition really works. So once we've got our three words, hello, Zoom people again. All right, this is where we get into what I used to cringe at as a scientist. As a researcher, I cringe when people are like, you need to tell a story. And I was like, come on now. Do I really need to tell a story? Or is that just something that science communicators say to make you feel like you're not doing it right? But 
the story structure really works. So remember, now we've got feelings. We've got the three word take home that we want people to kind of remember. And now we need to include it into a little bit of a story structure. And so A, B, T. Oh, now I get to do my, um, oh no, I've lost the pen. No, no, it's in my pocket. Oh, I'll get it. It's all right, it's behind the thing. Normally I can edit this stuff out of YouTube videos, but not today. All right. Oh. It's all right, Zoomers, we've got you. We're back. All right, so when we talk about A, B, T, oh, that's a, a pen's not too bad. All right, we say and, but, therefore, and you may have heard me talk about this before, but and, but, therefore is a simple story structure that you need to talk about your research in that framework. So, for example, the and is all the background information. So I wanted to pe people to kind of uh, know that I was talking about solar cells, nanoparticles, and solar paint. Those were my ands, and I connect them with ands. And you can do the same for your research, which is just like um, the information. Like, here's the background stuff. This is what you need to understand what I'm going to say next. So my and is like, um, you know, solar, solar panels are relatively inefficient. So we've made, uh, sorry. And we can, we can combat that with uh, nanoparticles made of conducting materials, and we can make it cheaply. So at the moment, I'm just saying, here are some background information. You know, this is what you need to know. And you can do the same thing for your, your research. Keep it to one or two ands. The but structure, the but in the middle, is, is now the most important bit, because people don't give a shit about information. They respond to problems. Everyone responds to problems. So once you've given them a little bit of background information, you need to hammer home the but, the problem that your research solves. So in my case, I was solving the fact that solar cell uh, like manufacture was so very expensive and that we can make very, very inefficient, uh, sorry, very, very, very uh, cheap and efficient solar cells. But people don't care about the end result, they just wanna know, well, how does it affect me? So I'm like, you know those silicon panels on your roof, they're really expensive. And people go, oh yeah, they are, yeah, I've just spent like six grand or 10 grand, and I'm like, I can do it cheaper. Not yet, that's like a little bit of like that research lie we tell, isn't it? But we say, yeah, that's the problem. So you make it as human as possible. So the but is very, very important. And you wanna make sure that it's as uh, relatable as possible to an individual. People don't quite often care about the group. They're not like, oh, well, that affects that person, that affects that person. We want to make sure that it's an individual problem. In my case, it's like it's costing you a bucket load to put solar panels on your roof. And uh, you just need to find that exact thing for you. And then the therefore. So the therefore for your research is essentially what you're doing. So therefore, I was making solar cells from conducting nanoparticles in a roll-to-roll -roll process in the same way they print banknotes and like newspapers and that sort of stuff. So you can chop up and have different bits of solar cell and plonk them on your roof. Now that, the therefore, is your specific approach to that problem. And that is where we tend to spend too much time as researchers when we talk about our work. When we talk about our work, we tend to want to talk about all the therefores. Therefore, we've done this. We've got this awesome problem, uh, like this awesome solution to this problem. Here we are. And people, you've probably had it. You've been at a party, I guarantee it, or you're talking to someone, and they say, oh, like, what do you do? And you go, oh, this is, and in your mind, you're like, this is the moment I get to impress them. And you tell all of the stuff. And you know that glaze that happened? You've seen it behind people's eyes. And they go, uh-huh, mm. Yeah, I'm just gonna go to the toilet, like, and you're like, oh, I've lost another one. How do I? That's because you've gone straight in with your solutions, and you haven't humanized that problem. And the the more human, more sort of like uh, individual you can make that problem, the better. What you want to do is make sure that after your problem statement, people go, Oh, that's interesting. How how do you solve that? That's the kind of key you get them to kind of to lead you to that next step, but you don't lead with all that awesome stuff that you really care about because it took you hours in the lab, in the office, in your research, in your design phase, you know, whatever it is, it took you hours and that's the bit you're proud of. Unfortunately, people, that is what people care about the least until you sell them on the problem. 
Hello again, people. All right. So once we've got these kind of different building blocks, so we've talked about having our three words, ish words. We've talked about a basic story structure. We've talked about a problem. Now what we've got to do is kind of lead people through that story. And there's something I learned that's incredibly powerful, and it's known as the two, three, one. And by those numbers, what I mean is energy levels through your talk or impact through your talk, right? One is the highest impact statement you can make about your work, the feel good stuff, right? When I was selling my business, I would always talk about the children, people like, like communicating science. Well, don't we want a next generation of empowered young students to come through, right? You can feel it bubbling up. You're starting to feel, oh yeah, this is good. This is something that like multimedia tells me is good. And you need to find that exact high energy statement for your research that you put right at the end of your presentation. Because remember we, we say people will remember how you made them feel. They're also gonna remember the last thing you told them mainly. <laughs> So we want that last statement to be super powerful. We want it to be your therefore, we've sold them on the problem, and it needs to be a bit pie in the sky. It's okay if it's blue sky at this point, right? It's okay that you kind of tell that research lie where it's like, this is what we're aiming for. We're not there yet, but imagine the world if we did achieve this. That's the vision you're selling at the end of your, your short talk. Now, oh, this move, this does move, great. So this is why I wanted this pen because if this is your talk, and this is the kind of energy or, or um, impact, we want to start strong. So we start at a two. So this is where we, we keep our energy level, and this is where we sort of like start our, our ands, our and statements, right? We say, oh, like, uh, in my case, it, was, it would be like, imagine a world where solar was affordable for everyone, right? Now we're talking, they know I'm talking about solar panels because that's in our and statement. We know we're talking about money. So we're starting high up that kind of like high energy stuff. Then we do three where it's the lowest energy in the middle of our talk. It doesn't, this bit in the middle, right? Doesn't matter too much. In a three minute thesis, it's the middle minute. No one remembers the middle minute of a three minute thesis, <laughs> all right? In the same way, no one remembers the middle five minutes of a 15 minute talk, right? Because everyone's, you're sat through 20 of them and you're like, oh, Jesus Christ, when is this over? And then you're like, oh, they're finished, great. And when they got their attention back, that's when you can hit them. But down here, we can make them. There's a trick I'll share with you in a minute. So this is our ands. This is our problem statement. And it can be low energy because we're, we're tailoring that information directly to people, okay? And the last thing, is our therefore. This is our big pie in the sky, and that's where we finish our presentation. This is where we can sell the world that we're working on at the moment. What does your research, if it all goes really, really well, what problems are you solving? What does the world look like? How have you changed the world? That is how you want to leave people at the end of a short talk, a 15 minute presentation, three minute thesis, whatever it is. Just leave people with that little bit of imagination and be passionate about it because you are. But research takes the passion away a little bit because we sat this or like in the lab doing stuff, right? It doesn't feel like a high energy thing. But when you're talking to people, you want to make sure that they really understand what the impact of your work is. So you can push it, be excited about it. Make sure that people are genuinely happy, you know, that you are doing that research. Now, there's our general structure, right? Let's make sure I'm not skipping ahead too much. Hello, Zoom people again. All right. So we've got our two, three, one. This is our navigation through our talk. Do you remember our three words? The three words that we want people to remember. We can spike them through our talk. And we need to do that to make sure people know the take home message. So what I like to do in a short talk is I'll spike like a three minute uh, sorry, our three word statement here, three word statement, and then somewhere before your big finish, a three word statement. So I can say, essentially, like solar, like we want solar panels to be cost efficient. I want solar paint 
to be cost efficient. Solar paint will, you know, and that's the sort of things that simple, you can phrase it kind of different if you want, but we want to make sure that when people leave, they remember those three words. The only way to make them remember is to actually just like drill it into their minds and say it right into their faces as much as you can, about three times. Maybe in a three minute thesis, you've only probably got enough time for two, but in a 15 minute talk, about once every five minutes, you want to make sure that you repeat a version, a repeat a version of your three to five word take home message. Because that's what people will remember. Okay? Now, here's an optional extra for people who want to uh, really make sure their presentation is memorable. And I'll share with you what I did. And this one won me, like this simple trick won me. Uh, nearly $100,000 in startup funding, and it was so easy that I feel embarrassed to uh, talk about it. Here I am at Pitchett Palace. I haven't got a beard. This was a few years ago now. But I call it the memorable moment, and it can be, it can feel a little bit lame because the memorable moment is about giving people a hook to remember, oh, there was that guy that did this thing, there was that woman that talked about, but she did this, or they did this. Now, do you remember I was talking about the, the presentations I remembered? I remembered a magic trick. Now, how, now, it was a bit lame watching it, I'll be honest, but I remember it. Ukulele. Bit lame when I was watching it, but I remember it, right? Think about all the, all the things you remember about people's presentations. And this is optional, right? If you don't feel comfortable doing it, but I tell you, if you can build up the courage just to put a little memorable moment in your three minute thesis, people will respond to it positively. So what I like to do is a memorable moment somewhere. And I normally like to put it here. So this is our memorable moment in a talk. It also really works well here somewhere. Memorable moment. So you have a memorable moment where it almost doesn't matter what you do. Like, it doesn't have to relate to your research at all. Dro exactly, if you want to do a mic drop in, remember that guy dropped the mic? You're like, why? No idea, right? Another one, so I actually got a load of papers. This is me, so my, my research uh, background led me onto this kind of science communication startup path. And I actually read one of my papers to the crowd until they got bored, right? And I was like, I was so excited about my research and this is how I told the world in organic nanoparticles based on blood. And I just talked about it, right? And I could see everyone go, oh no. And then I went, rubbish. And I chucked the papers and they went, Psh. like I had my, my uh, paper or my, yeah, I was only like five thick, but I put like 20 pages in. And so then I just went Psh. and it went everywhere, right? Now, I stole that because I saw it at someone else, uh, else's pitch uh, like years ago, and I was like, I'm having that. But it works because they come up to you and go, oh, you're the guy that threw the papers. What was your thing again? Right, they don't even remember what I said, but they remember that. So as cringy as it feels, let me tell you that it does genuinely make your presentation memorable. Maybe in a scientific conference, you, you're limited to what you can do. Three minute thesis and more performance based like, you know, like science in the pub and all that sort of stuff lends itself perfectly. But there are elements you can take to a scientific conference, even if you have some sort of weird animation that happens on one slide once. Do you know what I mean? Just something to break people out of their kind of comfort zone of that staring into information and being like, oh no, like, oh, here comes more information. But making a memorable moment really works. And it's hacky to all hell. One time, I bought this flash paper. Do you know what flash paper is? Magicians use it. They, it's like a little, like it looks like tissue paper and they put, um, I think it's, it's just a, it's like an explosive on it, like a nitrate or something like that. And you light it and it goes Phew! It had nothing to do with my presentation, right? I kind of like weaved it in a little bit, like really loosely. And I was like Phew! And people were like, whoa. Right, then they come to me like, oh, what was all in that paper? They didn't care about my talk, but it allowed me to be memorable and it allowed them to approach me to talk. And, you know, they may remember me, oh, there was that guy that had the flash paper and he talked about like solar paint or something. That's it, that's all you're gonna get, that's a win, all right? So there's the, my sort of like tricks 
If you're doing a short presentation, and like I said, we do short presentations as early career researchers because we're not important enough yet. So they go, here we are, we'll give them 15 minutes. Therefore, use these tricks, high impact, make sure you've got your story, make sure you've got your three word takeaway, and then go to your PowerPoint, right? Make sure that your PowerPoint follows your story and your structure and your three words, rather than trying to cram your, all of this into your PowerPoint. So do that last, and it really works. With your three minute thesis, you get one slide, right? Yeah, perfect. So you, know, you want that to just help sort of support what you're saying. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it kind of lends itself. The three minute thesis is great because you have to do these things. Otherwise, you're kind of just stuck talking about information. So good luck to those that are presenting. I'm a judge, uh, so be scared. Um, yeah, and use, you know, you don't, and one thing I want to say is you don't have to use all of these. You can use some of them as you feel, appro as, they, as they sort of like present appropriate um, sort of opportunities in your, in your talk. You do not have to use all of them, but I find at least trying to fit them in really helps. So there's the first bit. How are we going for time, by the way? It's one. All right, I've got about 10 more minutes. Is that right? Perfect. So now I want to talk about general dissemination of research information. Let me tell you this. As a startup founder who was in the science communication field, information being spilled out into the world in a haphazard way that universities typically do doesn't work. It just, I can't believe we're still thinking that like people need to know about our research just because it's important. One thing I've learned about uh, YouTube and having, so, you know, watching all the metrics on my videos and stuff is that there's loads of little, really simple things that you can do to actually make people care about your research. And it really comes from, and they say it all the time, but it's so true, knowing who you're talking to and what their problems are, right? It wasn't until I focused on who my audience was, the problems that they had, what they were actually asking, that I actually sort of was able to kind of, you know, build up a little bit of momentum. And so talking about your research, finding an angle, finding stuff that people care about is really the only way you can uh, disseminate your information because it, it takes on a life of its own. Once you sort of follow the tricks that I'm going to talk about, the information just goes. It, you don't have to force it. It's, it's like, you know, it just flows away from you and you meet all these lovely people and they invite you to talk in Sydney. And it's just, you know, a, such a nice sort of um, way of disseminating information. So. The first thing that I want to talk about, and I've kind of talked about it now, is no one cares. This is how you've got to approach your, your research dissemination. You've got to come from the fact that everyone has got their own sort of biases, their own interests, their own problems. They're interested in solving them. They're not interested in your research. And it's really sort of like, if you, if you start here, I guarantee you that it will sort of help you to sort of promote your research. But understanding that it is not just cramming information in people's minds, but much more of uh, finding out that about them, that is how you make people interested in your research. And uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is a really, let's make sure I'm not skipping ahead again. One thing that I want to talk about that is really powerful is answer the public. Now, answer the public, has anyone seen this before? Answer the public? No, right. Answer the public is essentially a website where you can go and you can find out what people are asking about your research and your field. So I went in and I typed in architectural science just to see what was, because I went to your research page and I was like, okay, what kind of research areas have they got? Okay, never heard of architectural science before. What are people asking about this stuff? Where is the general sort of community's understanding of your research? And you may or may not be happy about what I found. I don't know, but this is the starting point. But there's all sorts of stuff. How is science used in architecture? How is architecture related to science? Um, do architects use science? So you can see that these are the basic questions that people are asking the internet. These are all based on sort of Google searches and they congregate all these inf uh, sort of uh, information or collaborate, no, what's the word? Anyway, they bring it all together and they, uh, they essentially present it to you in a series of different diagrams. 
And it's really easy. And I would recommend you all go away and do this for your research area. You, if you type in your research area and there is zero <laughs> responses, <laughs> it means you've got to niche up, right? You've got to say, well, no one's interested in my very, very sort of like specific field of research, but they are interested in the next level up. They are interested in, and these are the general questions that people are asking. And that is where I recommend everyone starts with their research dissemination. It's understanding what people actually want to know about your research area. Because once you can solve their problems, once you know the level that they're interested in, that's when you can formulate that story. You can start pushing out information to answer these questions, but also slip in your research as well. This is like a Trojan horse of uh, research dissemination where you say, you know, you may do a blog post on how is science used in architecture, right? And then you say, at the University of Sydney, we're doing this, this, and this. And there we are. We've already, we've answered a question. We found ourselves to be super valuable for our audience, but also we're, we're teaching them a little bit about our research. And so I highly recommend that you do that for your research. And then Find the human problem that you can attach your research to. And we've talked about that a fair amount, but this is super important because if you're disseminating information through uh, like blog posts, through um, editors, even speaking to your marketing communication team at the University of Sydney, you need to make sure that they, because they don't, they don't understand your research like you do. You just got to make sure that as you approach them, you say, this is the actual human problem that I'm solving. Like, this is why it's important. This is why we should tell the world about our research is because this is, for an individual person, this is the result, okay? And it goes back to that storytelling we were talking about before. But if you start with those questions in mind and then find the human issues that your research is solving, that's when you can start reaching out to university teams, to editors, to newspaper um, journalists, whoever it is. So I spent about... Uh, 13 months or so as a writer for Cosmos magazine for all sorts of science communication outlets, the Royal, um, Royal Australian Science Channel and all that sort of stuff. And one thing that I learned was that when people approached me with their research, I needed to be sold, right? I needed to know why this is important. And just by making it a human issue makes me much more interested in it because I can write about it for my audience. All right, and then you can start building up relationships with journalists in your area, with the uh, university and comms team at the University of Sydney here, or anywhere else you can, but essentially approaching them and saying, this is like the human problem that my research addresses. I'm an expert because I'm researching in this area and this is my sort of uh, outcome. And like I said, understanding the sort of uh, level at which you need to pitch that information from the ask, answer the public will really help you just mold that into an, a, a sort of audience appropriate story. All right. I think that every single lab, every single research group should have a simple dissemination system of their work. You've got to start with the stuff you can control because you can write a blog post in, look, one thing I do all the time is I dictate, right? I just use Google, uh, Google Docs and they've got text to uh, speech to text and I just talk about my research, right? Talk about it in terms of the story structure we've talked about for your, you know, your three minute thesis and but therefore just talk, you know, do a little three minute thesis into Google Sheets and you uh, Google Docs, Sheets is the Excel one, isn't it? Um, but just stick it up on a lab blog, right? It doesn't have to be super complicated, but that is super low sort of barrier of entry to communicating your research. Um, and if you sort of answer some of the problems that you find on Answer the Public, boom, you're winning. Because people are searching for those, and if they come across your blog, the university's gonna love you, because you're gonna get your name out there. Um, Reach out, so after you've done the lab blog, that's kind of, like I said, the lowest, uh, easiest thing to do because you control it. The next thing I recommend you do is you reach out to the me media or comms team and you ask them about whether or not they've got a uni blog and you've just done a blog for your lab. So you can say, hey, I've got a blog, like I said. And I, one thing I want to say about this is that you have to just do what you've got time for, right? 
Researchers are always told you should be communicating more, get out there, and some people just aren't interested, and that's absolutely okay. But finding someone in the in the lab that is interested in this sort of stuff can really help sort of raise the uh, raise the profile of everyone in that group. So reaching and build, reaching out to your media and comms team and building up a relationship with them is very important. Ask them about their uni blog or press release. I've talked about this on uh, one of my sort of more popular videos, which is Kudos. So kudos, I think it's .com or .org, I can't remember the, the domain level. But um, essentially, they're a group that you put in some simple information into their website, and they'll help you turn it into a little package, and then it will be visible on their website. And also, I'm not sure if they promote it or what they do, but I know of some researchers who've had great success just by putting up their research, answering a few questions on a website about their research, their latest paper, their conference presentations, whatever outputs you, you do, put it on Kudos and see where it goes. It's completely in your control and it takes about sort of 20 minutes to half an hour if that. So really valuable website. Um, any industry specific publications, you can reach out to them. Journalists, journalists are tough though. Journal you, I remember reaching out to one journalist and I was like, hi, are you, are you busy? This actually, this was, yeah. I was like, are you, hi, I've got this thing that I want to talk about. And she, and, uh, she was like, I'm, I'm too busy. And I was like, that's fine. When can I call you back? And she said, never. <laughs> oh, oh, my heart, right? <laughs> so this was really hard for me. And uh, journalists are tough. But if you find a, a, a nice journalist, and that relationship, honestly, when I was on the science communication journalist side of things, if I had a scientist who would call me up with their information, it could lead nowhere, and it doesn't matter. You could just call them up and say, hey, we've just published this paper, it's got this and this, interested? They say no, and you go, fine, that's it. But at least having someone to go to, five minute conversation really helps. And there's some Australia specific stuff, you could even do it with um, specific industry magazines and publications, but just making sure that that's part of a dissemination process, like I said, Sometimes it's no, and that brings me on to my next point. Oh, and also I gotta say, put it on YouTube, but it's like putting information, informational stuff on YouTube is tough. But if you enjoy it, do it, right? If it's part of building your skills, you can include that into your dissemination kind of system for a lab or, or whatever. But uh, it's not for everyone, and I completely understand that. But uh, yeah, YouTube is a great place if you get that search term from Answer the Public, and you sort of do a video around that and sneak your research in, you're golden. All right, and the last thing I wanna say that I've learned from YouTube is, I do not know what will work. I sometimes think, oh, this video, mwah, it's got everything. It's got like the right sort of content, I've really worked hard on like the editing, I've got some graphics going on, and it flops. And I'm like, oh, this is right. Like, in, you know, my little sad YouTuber voice, I'm like, oh, this is so sad. Why does no one love me? But the truth is, is that it's fine. Sometimes you do all the right things and the world doesn't reward you. And that's why it's important to have a dissemination system. Because you go through whatever system you've got, and if no one, no one grabs it, no worries. But I can assure you that if you keep doing that system and you just do those simple blog posts, reach out to an editor, reach out to a journalist, put it into an industry magazine or try to get it in an industry magazine, something will happen eventually because there's so much noise in the universe that for some reason, things just align. You hit the right time, you hit the right person, you hit whatever it is. They've got a tough deadline. They've just had something drop from their, their, you know, from their publication. They need something to fill it. All of these things happen. So if you have just a simple dissemination system that you can do in half a day, just every time you have a, a um, paper, conference presentation, something of note, go through that system and see if anyone bites. And if they don't bite, no worries. There's always next time. But I don't know what will work, what will be successful. I'm starting to get an idea slowly as I learn more about like successful videos and that sort of stuff. But ultimately, no one knows and therefore, Keep trying, keep trying to promote, use your dissemination system, use all of the skills we've talked about today, and I guarantee you that at some point, someone will go, oh, that's interesting, stick that in the, ma in the magazine. Then you can say to university, look, I'm a famous uh, researcher, so you have to give me all your money. All right, and I think that, that brings me to about time. 
where I just want to say thank you so much for having me here. I hope with, with my YouTube videos, with you know, my first in-person talk, I just want to say thanks so much, and I, I always try to be as helpful as possible. That's another thing I found that really helps, is if you're relentlessly helpful, eventually people go, oh, that guy's really helpful, I guess I should listen to him a bit more. And after two years of doing this, you know, I, I finally feel the momentum, and it takes a lot of work, and that's what research dissemination, that's what content production it really sort of has, has taught me, is that it is just really hard work sometimes, but you've got to just go through those steps. So thank you so much. But that's it, yeah, and um, I don't know if, you want to ask me questions now or in the cafe, but uh, I'm happy to do either. But thank you very much. So there we have it. There's everything I think you need to know about the art of dissemination, but also the super impactful things you can do throughout a short presentation to make sure that your research is understood and it's remembered. Let me know in the comments what you would add. And also remember to go check out academiainsider.com. That's my project where I've got my eBooks, the Ultimate Academic Writing Toolkit, as well as the PhD Survival Guide. There's also links to my Insider Forum there. And also you should sign up for my free and exclusive newsletter. Go check it out at andrewstapleton.com.au forward slash newsletter. I'll put a link in the description. And when you sign up initially, you'll get five emails over about two weeks. Everything from the tools I use, the podcasts I've been on, how to write the perfect abstract, the perfect daily schedule, or more completely for free for you. So go sign up now and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks again to Alison and Tun for looking after me so well in Sydney. I had a great time.